Uh, so first of all, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Zainara Vascuñana. I am FEPS, uh, the Foundation for European Progressive Studies Head of Communication, and I am joined by the two speakers of the, the panel we are about to start. These are Michaela Kauer. Uh, she's co-coordinator of the EU Urban Agenda Housing Partnership and director of the Brussels Liaison Office of the City of Vienna. And we also have Tom Copley, who is deputy mayor of the City of London. So welcome both. Um, before we start the panel, let me quickly introduce the, the workshop, which is being organized by FEPS today. Um, so the audience can understand what we are going to do, because this is going to be only the first panel. Uh, but before that, uh, just a reminder, today is the second day of the Progressive Housing Week, which is a whole week dedicated to the topic of housing. It started yesterday with the opening, a big opening. If, in case you could not watch it, I really recommend you to watch it because it was fantastic. We could have speakers as the uh, European Commission Executive Vice President Franz Timmermans, but many others. And it's available in the platform Let's Get Digital, also in Facebook, YouTube, all possible channels. So as I was saying, we're going to first start uh, with Mikael and Tom speaking about common challenges for housing policy. So the goal is going to be to get to know uh, better the housing situation in these two cities, Vienna and London, but also to understand better what can be done um, at the city level from governance, uh, from local governments and what cannot be done as well. Um, after this session, we are going to have the presentation of a fantastic study that is just out of the open today. It uh, has been a study commissioned by FEPS and its partners, Concrete Actions for Social and Affordable Housing in the European Union. Union. And uh, afterwards, we're going to have the third part of the workshop, which is going to be a panel, um, a roundtable of four speakers, uh, which is going to have the title, The Liberlin on Affordability Strategies and Actions. That part is going to be moderated by my colleague, David Rinaldi, who is a FEPS Director for Studies and Policy, who is um, also uh, with us, even if we don't see him. And there are two other people uh, involved in the organization of this event. These are Eliane Omez and Elena Hill, my colleagues who are, uh, you cannot see them, but they are behind the scenes, making sure that this event is possible. So thanks everyone. And as uh, you may have noticed when I was introducing the different panels, I said a lot the words, actions, concrete, delivering, affordability, and these kind of words. So I want to stress here that this is not about wishful thinking, what we are talking here. Okay, the European Union has no direct competence to legislate in housing matters. Nevertheless, housing is a challenge in all EU, European Union uh, countries, also Europe, and I'm saying this because now, unfortunately, uh, the UK is not part anymore of the European Union, but it's a common challenge. And the root causes behind this challenge are also shared. And second factor, there is a lot that can be done at the EU level with the already available instruments. So this is why it's important to speak about this, even if, of course, uh, the intensity of the different challenges may differ from, from one country to the other. And I just want to say very quickly that, yes, COVID-19 uh, has made the situation even more alarming, but this is not a temporary crisis. This is a systemic and a structural crisis uh, that is putting our, at risk our social, economic and climate climate sustainability. So um, it's crucial that we tackle this if we uh, want to be taken seriously from citizens um, in, the, in the fight against social inequalities and also the climate emergency. So I stop here because I already spoke too much. Um, let me remind for those who are joining a little bit later, I am joined by Tom Copley, uh, who is Deputy Mayor for, Mayor for Housing and Residential Development in the City of London, and Michaela Kauer, who is Director of the Brussels Liaison Office of the City of Vienna and Co-Coordinator of the EU Agenda Housing Partnership. So welcome both. Thanks for joining us, first of all. And my first question, in order to get to know a little bit better the, the situation of housing in your cities, what would you say is the most pressing challenge, challenge in your city? Let's imagine there's a genie of the lamp who shows up now and uh, let you ask for one wish, not three, eh? one. What would you say, Michaela? Maybe we can start with you. Yeah, first of all, thanks to the Foundation of European Progressive Studies for organizing this event. And I have been a little bit in contact already before. 
And I think that when you start as a European foundation of that kind to talk about housing, you really come to cities very fast. So happy to be here with uh, Tom as well, because I see also lots of people from other cities in the, in the audience. That's great. So I think that connecting the European level with the local level is already a success. So thank you for that. When it comes to the, I would say, biggest challenge in Vienna, I must say that we are a fast growing city, like many big cities across uh, Europe. And the challenge is about in, in construction here is land, building ground, because that's something where you cannot, you know, reproduce land uh, forever or to the infinite. So we, we are really into the question of building ground because this is also one of the main cost drivers in construction. Thank you so much, Michaela. Uh, Tom, please. Thank you very much uh, for having me here. And yes, thank you to, to FEPS as well. And it's wonderful to, to, to be on with Michaela. Um, we can all learn, I think, a lot from Vienna and Vienna's um, incredible history uh, when it comes to housing and in particular social housing, which is you know, what we all want to deliver. I, I think the biggest challenge facing us in London is undoubtedly the issue of affordability. Uh, we've recently seen the, the average house price in London uh, pass uh, £500,000, uh, pounds, so half a million pounds, similar in, in euro, um, uh, uh, just recently. Uh, our rent, the rent on a one-bedroom flat in London is the same uh, rent uh, in the private rented sector as for a three-bedroom house outside of London. Uh, so there is an enormous disparity in affordability uh, between London uh, and the rest of the country. Um, and, and it hasn't always uh, it hasn't always been to this degree. Uh, London has a great history. Our predecessor bodies, as, as the, the Greater London Authority has, uh, a great history of building uh, social uh, and council housing uh, for people to live in. Uh, that's sort of resuming uh, again under the current uh, mayor. Uh, but it's really important that we that we get back to that if we're going to make living in London more affordable. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you very much, both. Um, we need to start, it's unavoidable, referring to COVID-19 crisis. I would like to better understand how is this affecting your city and what if, if there's something that you can do at, uh, from local governments. And then um, also I'd like to know if you think there's any possibility that this crisis can be a sort of wake up call. As I was saying, this is not um, a temporary crisis, the housing one I'm referring, it's a systemic crisis. So uh, Tom, if you want to continue maybe? Certainly, yes. I mean, I think COVID has made us all think much more about uh, how we live and where we want to live, um, partly because we've been spending so much more time in our homes during lockdown. It's made a lot of people think about that. I think there are some big questions for the future development of cities in general and, and certainly London. It's not quite clear yet what the long-term impact of COVID is going to be uh, on that, uh, but that's something that we'll be monitoring very, very closely. We've certainly seen people, for example, uh, maybe uh, moving, uh, uh, wanting, th thinking of moving perhaps out of inner London, more to outer London. Uh, so we have to look at whether these trends are ones that are going to continue or whether this is just something I temporary. And actually, once once COVID is over, people actually want to return to, you know, the, the sort of the, the vibrant inner city life they were living before. I think in terms of some other impacts of COVID, I mean, one of the, the first things that we did uh, in London, uh, the, the first actions we had to take was to protect homeless people. Mm -hmm. uh, and particularly people sleeping rough on the streets. And I think that's one of the, uh, 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 almost one of the, the, the great achievements that we saw during the first lockdown was actually getting homeless people off the streets, helping them to self-isolate in hotels. And genuinely, some, of, some, some lives have been turned around by this. Certainly lives have been saved. We know the COVID infection rate amongst homeless people in London has been much, much lower than in many other uh, world cities. It's helped people to get their life back on track. But I think that the crucial thing is we need the government, national government, to continue to fund this. Um, we had the funding to do what was called everyone in, getting everyone into hotels during the first lockdown. That same level of funding hasn't been made available this time around, bearing in mind this time around it's winter and we have a new, much more virulent, uh, contagious strain uh, of COVID. So actually there, there is an opportunity there really uh, to have a transformative impact on rough sleeping and on homelessness if the government will continue uh, to make funding and resources available for us to do that. Mm -hmm. 
Michaela, please. Yeah, I think uh, what we should keep in mind when we are talking about COVID-19 and housing is that, in fact, the COVID-19 pandemic has aggravated an already existing housing crisis. And that is something we, uh, as, as Tom said, uh, this is something where we are really uh, under pressure in many, many cities. In Vienna, we immediately imposed or decided to have a, a ban on evictions in our municipal housing company. And uh, that was very important to protect people. And also the cooperative sector, which is quite big as well in Vienna. We have nearly 60 uh, cooperative or for limited profit housing associations building and running 200,000 homes in, in Vienna. So they also did that same thing. But when it comes to rental law, again, it's, it's a question of the national government. And here we have seen that obviously after a discussion, they did something uh, to protect both uh, people in their homes, but also business when they couldn't pay back, pay the rent. Uh, and in fact, this is a very, very weak solution in the national government. So I think that uh, we've seen throughout Europe that where we have bold protective systems, people have been much more on the safe side of things when it comes to housing. And just one thing, because we are all urban feminists here, right? Uh, for women, this is especially, especially uh, a severe issue because I think no woman now can hear the word home working anymore. I mean, they're simply fed up with it. And I think that because the functionality of homes has changed so much. You know, before it was anyway, the woman doing all the, all the work at home, but now she was also doing that. Plus she was doing homeschooling and home teaching and home working and blah, blah, blah. So this is really something which we also should keep in mind when we talk about housing and COVID-19. Michaela, since you referred to it, uh, you mentioned um, that it's important to have a bold, a bold protective system. Uh, I want to refer to the case, uh, the particular case of the city of Vienna, because it's uh, often referred as a role model for the other cities in in Europe. So I would like to better understand if um, what what did trigger that, and and how did you do it? Yeah, first, I think uh, I invite everybody to visit the virtual stand of the city of Vienna in this conference because there's a funny video, a nice video with funny music. I must say, go there, not now, but later. And uh, it clearly shows that, I mean, we are, we are well off because we had one, more than 100 years of time to do things. And we started like in the 1920s when we built the first municipal housing complex in Vienna. And we did that throughout all the years, except for the time of fascism. I mean, this is also to be said. And we continued to build houses even and homes for people, even in the time of the great financial crisis after 2008 and nine. So for us, it has always also been a counter cyclical investment. And I think taking the money and having also a bold and stable financing system, because in Austria, it's, it's the, the housing uh, uh, subsidies are financed via a tax and every employee will pay like 1% of his, of his income on, on for housing. And that is a way to redistribute a little bit the, the, the money in, in the pot. But it's, it's, it's really having a stable, revolving financial system to underlying uh, other measures like protection of tenants, security mm -hmm. of tenure, unlimited contracts. This is the best security and the best protection of tenants clear rent regulations in most of the of the uh housing uh, i would say systems we offer from the municipal housing to the to the cooperative and for low profit housing so we have a lot of measures and that makes the big difference but i think the biggest difference is the high share of publicly subsidized and owned housing in the city that mm -hmm. makes us really proud and this is also something where i must say we never privatized and this is a mistake that has been done in many cities, sadly, sadly. And I, I would love to hear from Tom also about his opinion about the right to buy and how it works, because I think that privatizing and selling your housing, this opens the door for all the brutal financial investors. And we've seen that happen in Stockholm and in Berlin, places where you would think that social welfare is quite common, a 
really acknowledged, but even there you will have issues in the housing market. So mm -hmm. never sell your housing stock. That's my biggest recommendation at this point. Yes, actually, you're pointing at exactly the, the uh, point that wanted, I wanted to see also with Tom, which is um, speculation, which is the, the, the issue of the finance, which is probably the root cause behind the housing crisis situation in, in many cities, as my own city, for example, Barcelona, no, which uh, has been sold to, to foreign rich investors, no, selling also the soul of the city. Um, tell us a little bit more in, in this sense about London, please. Yes, of course. I mean, um, if you look at overseas investment in London, uh, actually, the, the biggest chunk of overseas investment in London isn't in residential property, it's in commercial property. So about 70% of commercial property transactions involve overseas uh, investment. In the residential market, in terms of the new property, it's about 13%. So 87% is, is, is UK. Uh, but of course, some of that 87% is also going to be domestic property speculation uh, as well. So it's not just about overseas your speculation it's all sorts of speculation i think what the important thing is to ensure that where you're getting um investment into housing whether it comes from overseas or uh, when it comes domestically is it uh, providing additionality is it giving us new housing for people to live in is it contributing towards affordable housing through our planning system which is which is absolutely uh uh, uh crucial um and unfortunately in london we don't really have any levers at the city uh, level uh for uh, any kind of tax or control over property speculation whether it's domestic or overseas uh it all has to be done by national government and there's only some very very light national government regulation there is an additional rate of what we call stamp duty land tax for uh, uh overseas uh, buyers that's it uh i think there is a question about you know whether or not um the government should be bringing in perhaps some other uh, measures whether that to you know whether that, that could then raise some money which could then be invested into affordable housing which i think would be uh would be positive on them um, i mentioned the right to buy i mean yeah in london uh, in 1981 35 percent of all the housing in london was was social housing it's now around 21 percent. so you know that that's quite a drop um and the, the really um the really striking and sort of ridiculous thing about this is how much of the housing that was sold on the right to buy, bearing in mind that right to buy was supposed to be, it was sold as this is about owner occupation, this is about individuals buying a house and living there and getting on the property ladder. But I did some research a few years ago, 40%, more than 40% of the homes sold on the right to buy in London are now rented out by private landlords. So it's not that they're owner occupied, it's not people getting on the property ladder, it's now landlords owning these, renting them out at, you know, three times or more the rent of the council sometimes back to the council that sold them because the council has to house homeless families and doesn't have enough of its own housing so it has to rent back homes to the, to the sold, which is a, which is a ridiculous situation yeah. mm -hmm. thank you tom very much um i forgot to mention at the beginning but of course a message to the audience Questions are more than welcome. We will have at the very end uh, some space for that questions. But since um, I, I see that we got one uh, uh, directly addressed to Tom, which is if you're in Let's Get Digital is in the left side of the of the screen. Uh, this person, Barbara uh, Stingbenberg, sorry if I didn't pronounce that well, says, Tom, what is the latest development in the UK in introducing a rent freeze, rent caps, uh, rent price stops, PRS regulation is overdue? Sure. So, um, one of the most ludicrous things about um, uh, the housing market in London is, despite the fact that now more than a quarter of London is rent from a private landlord, the mayor of London, our city government, has no power over private renting uh, at all. Um, all the uh, regulations and laws around tenancy, whether it's length or anything like that, or, or levels, that's all set nationally. And we don't have any rent control, uh, not in England. Uh, in Scotland, uh, there are certain measures, but in England, uh, there is no uh, rent control. Um, the, the the standard tenancy length is either six months or a year, uh, and very much the pendulum is uh, is swings towards the, the landlord. The power is with the landlord, not with the tenant, and that's something that our mayor has been lobbying to change. The mayor wants the power um, to be able to introduce some form of rent control, to have greater protection, uh, for, uh, tenants, uh, in London. And he has called for a rent freeze, a two year rent freeze now in response to, 
uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So it's something where the mayor is lobbying the government, but where we unfortunately don't have any power to introduce this ourselves. Michaela, what about Austria and Vienna? What is the situation regarding drug control there? Well, it's, um, it's, uh, it's a very differentiated system, I must say. When you're living in municipal housing in Vienna, there will be no difference uh, for the rent you have to pay uh, with regard to where exactly the home is across the city landscape. So it will be always the same rent you pay. And that is part of a little bit, I would say, the magic uh, success because we have build, been building uh, municipal housing all over the city in order to have really in the richer areas, in the not so rich areas of the city, a very, you know, typically bourgeois areas and working class areas, we built that everywhere. And that means that your social status will not ever be recognizable uh, with regard to your address. And I think that's something which is really important. So. That's part of the of the system in the in the rental system. In in fact, obviously, still we we have in the private sector very high rents, and I think that this system is uh, very much uh, to the favor of the landlords. They profit from public investment in infrastructure like metro lines, bus stops, lightning, you know, all the technical infrastructure ab above and 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 below ground, uh, and they, they add this to the to the uh, to the rent they are asking from the tenants. So I think here we, we, we still have uh, some room to improve, but at least we have set up a lot of uh, possibilities to protect tenants, uh, including we, we, we work together very closely with tenants organizations. I'm happy to see Barbara Steinberg in the audience, the, the uh, Brussels representative of the International Union of Tenants. Uh, and, and we really value this cooperation. And we also set up like low threshold legal dispute uh, is, uh, I would say, um, uh, systems where the city, in fact, provides legal assistance to tenants when they have an issue with the landlord is not doing a renovation, which is necessary, or the rent is too high, or things like that. So I think that here we can do a lot as a city, but again, rental law is a national competence. And we are here in a difficult position, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, Michaela, you mentioned a point that uh, I think it's also very important, which is the role of the private sector. And mm, this may be connected with something that Tom said right before about urban planning. Uh, what can be done um, through urban planning to improve affordability? In Vienna, I think we do a lot. What we do, especially because, first of all, we need the building ground. And again, very often, we in many cities, we do see that the, the available land that is still in public ownership is sold to the developers. I would strongly recommend not to do that. I would strongly, and we do that in Vienna a lot, strongly recommend to give long-term lease contracts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because keep the control of the land. That's really important. And then what we do, what we did last March indeed, no, March, March 2019, sorry, um, you kind of lose one year with this COVID thing <laughs> in your memory, in a way. <laughs> anyway, uh, we, 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 we decided to have a new uh, category in our zoning law. And that means we now have in any urban development, two thirds have to be dedicated to social, publicly uh, uh, funded, cooperative, affordable housing two thirds. And the last thing we do, I mean, we do a lot of other things, but the last thing we do is we also have something we call builders contracts. So whenever we have, a, and we have competition in, in the system, because we when we have a development site, a big one, we invite all the, the, the interested companies and many of them typically in Vienna will be for low profit or for limited profit uh, housing companies. They are entering into competition with each other, and we decide uh, on the grounds of is the financial uh, financial aspect solid, is the, the 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 sustainability aspect there? Do we have uh, other you know several categories to decide, and that makes also a whole a, a big difference when you start uh, working together with the private and with the third sector with under commonly agreed rules. I would say. 
Mm. Tom, uh, what about urban planning in, in London? How, because I understood it's an important measure, right, for you? Yes, absolutely. And the current mayor, Sadiq Khan, has been policies have been very successful at um, increasing the amount of affordable housing that we get from private development. Uh, so the mayor has introduced two thresholds in his planning policy. Uh, on privately owned land, the threshold of 35% affordable, and on publicly owned land, at least 50% uh, affordable. Um, and uh, that has successfully increased on the big applications, which the big planning applications, which the mayor uh, sees, as it were, uh, uh, that comes through City Hall. The, the amount has gone up from 22%, the amount of affordable housing, to now, if you look at it by habitable room, 40%. Uh, under uh, uh, under Sadiq Khan. So these planning policies have had a major, major impact. And it's really, really important that where private development is taking place, that we get the maximum amount of affordable um, housing. Uh, and private developers had got very, very good uh, uh, previously, you know, understandably that they're, they're, they're private, private companies, uh, uh, you know, making sure, uh, 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 perhaps not delivering quite the level of affordable housing they should be. Uh, we've now, you know, got a, a very um, strong team of experts within City Hall who really make sure that we are getting, you know, the maximum amount deliverable of affordable housing uh, out of out of private developers. And just on land, um, Michaela mentioned land, and I think we're very much on the same page on this. Um, you know, the mayor has been much more interventionist in the land market now. He has a, he has a land fund. He has been buying land to bring it forward for development with much higher levels of affordable housing. We're talking between 50 and 60% uh, affordable uh, housing uh, uh, on this land that's, that's coming forward. And he's also developing the land that he controls through uh, uh, Transport for London. So Transport for London, which runs London Underground, owns large amounts of land. Uh, they're now developing their land as well, delivering uh, uh, housing. Uh, and the average across its portfolio is 50% affordable. So not only is it raising uh, money to go into our transport network, it's also delivering affordable housing for people to live in as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, and also, if I understood correctly, through urban planning, so by uh, forcing private developers to dedicate a part of, of, of the houses to affordable housing, you also get to get mixed communities, right? And also you tackle the, the issue of inclu inclusivity, inclusiveness, sorry, is that I don't think we have we will have the time to go in deep now because it's incredible, but we have been speaking for half an hour now. And I want to leave a, uh, a little bit of time to talk about the European dimension and the questions. But if you can quickly mention that part, the importance of having mixed communities. Mm. Tom, maybe? I, I think, and yes, it, the mixed communities actually sit at the heart of the mayor's London plan we don't want to have you know we we, we don't want uh, uh housing to be uh, sort of segregated by you know social class or or other factors we want people to be living from different backgrounds different socioeconomic backgrounds living together side by side london fortunately does have quite a good history of this so um as michaela was saying earlier about vienna uh london has built social housing in wealthy uh, neighborhoods so that people uh, genuinely throughout London, throughout most of London, do live side by side. Uh, we don't have people separated out based on class uh, for the most part in terms of where their housing is. Um, so, you know, th so that principle, that principle of mixed communities sits at the heart of the London plan. It's something that the mayor wants to build on and continue. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. As uh, I guess it's now clear when we're speaking about affordability, we are not only speaking about the people who don't have a roof uh, on their shoulders, even if that's, of course, the most dramatic case. We're speaking about people who can not live where they work, uh, who are living in not decent conditions, um, energy, poverty, and so on and so on. Uh, but of course, I want to I want to refer also to those people who don't have a roof, the, uh, people without a home. And there's a question for you, Michaela. Uh, from uh, Freak, um, I am unable to pronounce the, the family name, but the question is in the right side of the screen. It says, Vienna social housing role model in Europe, how come that it has been unable to prevent uh, um, 11,000 people every year to experience homelessness? I, the question moved now. <laughs> and this yeah. to spend 70 million euro annually on shelter and other non-solutions to homelessness. I would expect the model city to do better on most extreme form of housing exclusion. Thank you, Frick, for the question. 
Michaela, yes. where is yours? No, no, thanks. Uh, and I was expecting that question, in fact, because Frank is asking this in any discussion we have together. So, uh, and just to use the opportunity, I'm, I think that really it is important to talk about homeless people, especially in times of uh, COVID-19, because how can you possibly uh, isolate yourself or put yourself in confinement if you don't have a home? That's impossible. And I do see with great concern that a lot of cities, however, they have done a lot of efforts. I mean, Tom was, was you know, talking about what London did and it's remarkable, but, and they put, you know, people in like, um, like provisional solutions. What we really need is solutions that are lasting and that are combined with empowering people to live not only on their own, but also to live from their own income. And let me refer to one really important thing, which is the housing first concept. Uh, which is started in Finland, and we have also uh, adopted it in Vienna, obviously, and we take care of, as Freik rightly says, of 11,000 people in different forms of, uh, of, of homes, uh, according to our possibilities and, 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 and uh, our, obviously, also money that we have, budgets that we have, but we are clearly committed to have people in stable housing conditions uh, and in immediate good housing and when they get off the street. And we, and I think this is really something uh, where we are on the same page, everybody here. Yeah? But we really have to be concerned about what happens after COVID-19 and people will use again all these places, stadiums, uh, I don't know, public libraries. I don't know where even the European Parliament took in uh, a few homeless women. Uh, over uh, during COVID-19 and the confinement. So I think that what happens after after the crisis with all those people, will we then, and we will count on organizations like FEANSA uh, to, to help all the decision makers on all government levels to find solutions where we can house everyone that has been, you know, helped during the crisis, but needs more help after that as well. Thank you, Michaela. Let me uh, put on the table another question from the audience. Uh, they're being more and more active. This one is for Tom. So this is Joaquin from Community Land Trust Brussels. I was wondering if you could share your thoughts on how making land available for community-led projects has contributed to increasing the supply of affordable housing in London. Thank you very much uh, for that question. Yes, the mayor has a community housing fund, uh, which uh, he has a target to deliver uh, 500 community-led homes. Um, it's fair to say that community-led housing in uh, London, uh, in the UK in general, and in London in particular, is not perhaps at the level it is in some European uh, countries. Uh, we do have small pockets of the country and indeed some bits of London where there is a sort of tradition of this. But for the most part, it's tended, when it comes to affordable housing, it's tended to be the state or charitable housing associations that have, that have delivered. But we're you know, determined that um, community-led groups should be supported to deliver community housing. So first of all, the mayor has delivered this uh, a community led housing hub, which is about um, bringing together people to exchange ideas and experience and knowledge, because a lot of groups, you know, they're, they're starting out from scratch and they need that, that experience. And secondly, as I say, the community led housing fund, uh, which is actually distributing um, funding uh, in order to deliver these schemes. Um, there are a number underway uh, around London. The mayor's supporting uh, two through uh, Transport for London, I mentioned earlier on his own land, one actually at Cable Street, uh, Michaela. Uh, yes, there is, so there's, there, there's all sorts going on uh, at Cable Street. Um, so, uh, so the mayor indeed is leading by example through Transport for London uh, uh, and through his various funds in order to support community housing. Mm. Thanks, Tom. Um, just sorry, I, Lara, can I just say because of the course. Community Land Trust in Brussels is doing extraordinary good work, and we just just Excellent. mentioned that because this is really something where we are we can all learn from them. Really, Joaquin, happy to have you here. Thank you so much. We are unfortunately arriving to the end of the first panel. I mean, I could continue for hours, but I don't want to close this, this panel without referring to the role of the EU, because of course, no, uh, this, is, this is the whole purpose, to exchange best experiences and, and common challenges, but, but also to better understand what can be done at the EU and European level. Um, Michaela, maybe if you want to take this one, how can the EU support cities? 
Well, first, it would be good if Mrs. von der Leyen invites the mayors, because Joe Biden did that just after he was elected. <laughs> and, and we're still waiting for, I mean, my mayor is still waiting for the invitation of the commission president. Um, because I think when we look at the, the work program for 2021 of the European Commission, there is not one time the word cities in it. So that's one just little wish, you know, like it's Easter and, 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 and Hanukkah and everything at the same time. So, um, but when I, when I think about the EU, they can do a lot to de-block investment. And we, I mean, you will, I think, speak about that when you present the study and at other occasions, but revision of the state aid rules, um, changing the economic governance system and much more control and transparency. What's going on with the buyout and sellout of cities with regard to financialization? I think that here we really need more transparency. We need a transparency to registry for all the transactions that are going on by in this brutal financial world, world that has made a commodity commodity out of housing instead of really highlighting the fact that it is a human right. Voila, c'est fini l'histoire. It's as easy as that transparency. Michaela, sorry, if you can develop further, but in 30 seconds, the point of change stated rules, because you mentioned that, that, that I believe that's a very important point. What do you mean by that exactly? Uh, well, we need more time, but I just briefly, I would say, Normally, state aid is something which is not really nice in the context of EU competition law. And it's, there is only a few exemptions for hospitals, schools, etc. And there is an exemption for housing because housing is a competence of the member states. And that means that the EU should not interfere when it comes to state aid to housing. But there is an exemption in the exemption and that says it's allowed only if it's targeted to a very small group of disadvantaged, sorry, people. And that means this has opened, in fact, the ground for a whole lot of court cases. And it has created a lot of legal uncertainty and unclarity on the side of public investors. And in most cases, it's cities and local authorities. And this is why we think that as long as there is not more clarity in the state aid issue and the european parliament in its recent report on housing now calls for more clarity with regard to that and i think the european pillar of social rights could also make a big contribution uh, to give us this certainty on in the legal field with regard to our public investment and i think here this is something where we can really i mean talk hours but i, I leave it like that thank you michaela tom i guess brexit is going to affect this somehow but I guess there are other ways, maybe an informal framework of cooperation uh, for London to keep participating in this exchange and, 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 and coordinated action, right? Yes, absolutely. You know, just because we are leaving the EU, which I regret bitterly, uh, doesn't mean that we stop talking to each other. Uh, we keep talking to each other. We keep learning from each other. Uh, you know, I, I, I would love to, once we're allowed to travel again, I'd love to come to Vienna and visit some of the wonderful uh, housing. And Anne Hidalgo is doing great stuff in Paris. There's all sorts of things that we can be learning from each other uh, around um, uh, around Europe. Uh, and um, just in terms of what the what the EU could be doing, even if, even if we're outside it, and by the way, I, I think that given all of the administrative barriers that are, that are coming up, I think, you know, we are going to gradually move back towards the EU in many areas. You know, watch this space. I hope so anyway. But I think money laundering and transparency is a really crucial thing. The former Prime Minister here, David Cameron, the man who thought it was such a good idea to have a referendum on the EU, uh, but he actually committed to setting up a register of land ownership essentially here so we could find out who owns what. Yeah. That unfortunately has um, sort of been washed away and, and has never has never happened. And I think it really does need to happen. And I think it's exactly the kind of thing that, that um, would be best done on a European wide level. Yeah. Thank you so much. I am afraid I need to close the, <laughs> this session. It has been a, a fantastic conversation. I hope everyone feels the same. Um, thanks so much for, for joining, also for the audience. But we are not done. We are not done. We still have 
two more uh, parts of this workshop, but as I was mentioned, Lynn, at the beginning. I'm going to leave now the floor to Dr. David Rinaldi, who is my colleague in FEPS, Director for Studies and, and Policy, and also lecturer at the ULB University in Brussels. So as I was referring at the beginning, Today, we are launching a very important study, uh, FEPS and its partners, and I'm going to let David to introduce this study. Thanks so much. We thanks. say goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, Thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot, Michaela, Ainara, and Tom, for this very open and passionate uh, discussion, which uh, I think is a very good, a very good way to kick in into um, a little bit of a more scientific moment that we will have uh, for the next 20 minutes because we will present uh, um, a study that we publish today and I immediately invite uh, uh, two colleagues, Sergio Nazare Aznar uh, and uh, Nuria Lambea Yop to turn on their, their webcam uh, if they can, their microphone, they can turn okay. it on already. Uh, and you can uh, uh, perhaps already start trying to put the, the presentation, uh, to screen the presentation, while I, I mention to, uh, our, uh, to our audience uh, <laughs> that it is exactly uh, from one hour ago that they can find uh, online this, uh, this work. You can find it here. Uh, basically, it's a study on uh, on co on uh, concrete action for social and affordable housing in the EU. Uh, Sergio Nazare Aznar, full professor of civil law and director of the UNESCO uh, Housing Chair, uh, and uh, Nuria Lambea Yop, postdoctoral researcher at the same UNESCO um, Housing Chair uh, at the Public University of uh, Tarragona, Universitat Rovira e Virgili. Uh, they have been uh, extremely active. Sergio has been our uh, <coughs> our coordinator for the study that has been developed uh, uh, together with uh, Milan Fetaknik uh, that will be later uh, with us, as well as with R Liga Raznaka. The study will mostly focus mostly focus on on several dimensions. We try to give uh, you know to give a, to have a, a look at uh, inclusiveness, affordability, sustainability, uh, the common challenges that are affecting housing in Europe. Uh, you will hear very soon from Sergio and Nuria. Uh, but uh, I have to mention that a valuable contribution of of, of this study is, uh, is the presence of a very thorough. Uh, case studies that look at uh, six countries: Spain, Netherlands, the UK, Slovakia, Austria, and we and Latvia actually broader because we we look at the entire Baltic, uh, at the entire at the three Baltic countries, not only uh, not only Latvia. Um, in, instead, we heard a little bit on uh, on on the common challenges already in this uh, you know in the first talk. So perhaps we thought we thought of, of structuring this presentation a little bit more around uh, the, the the country studies and the lesson that we have learned from the analysis of this. Uh, Sergio and Nuria, I leave you uh, <laughs> the floor uh, immediately. Okay, thank you very much, David. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me start by thanking. Julian and also David for trusting us uh, both in this project and, and also for inviting us here today. Uh, Professor Nassar and I will be presenting the results of, of this report that uh, David has mentioned, which we have co-authored together with uh, Milan Ftachnik and Liga Rajnaka. Um, then um, I'll explain a, a bit more about uh, the introduction, and then I'll give the floor to uh, Professor Nasarre. Housing affordability, housing sustainability, and inclusiveness. These are the three key aspects that have guided all our research, starting, of course, by delimiting their concepts, which are sometimes unclear or not very easy to define. Then, as David said, uh, countries selection has followed criteria, first of all, of the dimension, bigger and smaller countries but as well as a geographic location. So we have 
the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, and England in particular, and Austria representing Nordic and Western Europe countries. Then we have Spain representing Mediterranean countries, and Slovakia, Latvia, and the other Bal Baltic countries uh, for Eastern Europe. Uh, in order to choose and highlight the best practices, we have used objective criteria. Aspects such as the budget, the scope, beneficiaries, real impact and results, among others. Um, the same thing with the lessons learned, pointing out strengths and weaknesses and the replicability of the measures or the policies. Therefore, all in all, we have undertaken a bottom-up approach extracting lessons and recommendations for the EU countries from the best practices and, and lessons learned in the countries that we have reviewed. In the following two slides, these two ones uh, that I'm not going to go into them because we do not have time, but um, what we have done is you have all here the best practices and lessons learned from each country that has been gathered together here. And then I'm going to move to the next table, this one that you have in the study, you can find it in the study. This table summarizes all the common features and challenges of the housing sectors studied and classified them into six different areas. We talk about governance, we talk about urbanization and affordability, social rental housing, migrants and Roma, housing deprivation and homelessness. Um, although there are a lot of topics in there, there are three main ones that are the most commonly addressed by the national reporters. The first one, which is in this uh, here, I'd say, is the impact of the process of urbanization on housing and affordability. The lack of territorial cohesion, geographical land restrictions, the gentrification of cities and touristification. In that sense, housing and affordability has been highlighted in all studied countries. The second field, and then I move to the next slide, the second field that has been addressed by nearly all studied countries is social rental housing in two different approaches. The first one is the size of the share uh, of the stock, either too big or too small. And secondly, um, we talked about the management or mismanagement of this stock. And finally, the last uh, big challenge is housing deprivation in terms of lack of adequacy of housing in different fields. We talk about the need for renovation of the stock, improvement of energy efficiency, and universally accessible housing and independent, independent living, mainly for disabled and or aging people. Finally, and other challenges that are mentioned, but uh, as we don't have time, we, we, we cannot address here and they are treated to a less, lesser extent, are housing governance in terms of uh, lack of coherence in housing policies and insufficient data and research in relation to housing, immigration, refugees and Roma people, housing insecurity, and last but not least, homelessness and its different forms, roofless people, hidden homelessness, squatting, among others. Homelessness is a problem that is on the rise in nearly every European uh, country. I'm giving now to the floor, uh, the floor to Professor Nasarne, who will elaborate further on these challenges as well as, as the lesson le lessons learned. Thank you. So thank you very much. I'm trying now to take control of the presentation. Yes, thank you. It works. Um, first of all, thank you very much to uh, Eulian and, and David for uh, um, trusting us. And uh, thank you also to the, to, to the other members of the team, uh, Milan, uh, Liga. I think uh, we have worked very well together. Thank you very much for uh, allowing us to do a proper scientific research and objective research and, and trying to approach all these topics from an objective perspective. Um, um, and yes, as uh, Dr. Lambert has uh, just pointed out, this is a, a bottom-up approach. It is approach taking examples, uh, good experiences, not so good experiences, uh, difficulties, barriers, uh, all, all the problems that, uh, and, and interesting results of um, cases uh, in several European countries. And uh, take and, and we have tried to take some uh, 
con conclusions and common trends uh, in relation to them. So this is uh, this is the methodology, and basically here in this uh, in this slide you see here. Um, uh, this uh, for uh, the, the, fir the, the first topic that Dr. Lambia has mentioned. This is the problem of uh, urbanization. This is a, a, a one of the most common problems uh, in our cities in uh, in Europe, uh, which has impacted in housing and affordability, the lack of territorial cohesion, the, ge the geographical land restrictions, cities gentrification, and uh, touristification. These are some of the topics that have been addressed in the in the report regarding uh, to affordability. Uh, there are some examples here uh, in Spain, in the United Kingdom, in the in the Netherlands that have been tackled through the creation of uh, different functional types of housing tenure. So uh, we are talking about here housing tenures, diversification. Di uh, it's also well known as continuum of housing tenure. So trying to find and to regulate and to draft policies uh, regarding different types uh, of accessing uh, uh, to housing to make them affordable and, and secure at the same time. Um, um, affordability has been tackled in Austria, in the Netherlands, as, as has been mentioned in the, in, in, uh, in the presentation of before, uh, through rent control for the public housing and the point system of, of, for tenancies in the, uh, in the Netherlands, and also um, uh, avoiding uh, the estigmatization and the geotization uh, processes uh, through the mi mixity, creating mixed communities uh, using this tool of um, creation different range of uh, of housing tenures. Um, also, um, uh, we have uh, identified uh, several ways of uh, in intervention of the public administration in the in the housing market, and we have uh, put them in order here, from uh, less intrusive into the housing market to uh, to more intrusive. Um, just here in the United Kingdom, for example, the creation of housing associations, uh, very similar to this uh, limited uh, profit housing associations in the in, in Austria, um, which are uh, which uh, may 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 seem strange, but they, they are not very common in many other European countries and many other countries in the world, and they are a very good example of this combination of public private private partnerships. So trying to combine together interests of the uh, private market and private agents with the uh, public policies and public goals that are desired by everybody. Um, uh, Austria. This is the second the second example of this in the intervention has been done through the supply side uh, of financing and and subsidized housing uh, through uh, specifically through uh, soft government loans uh, to these housing associations uh, with uh, these uh, very nice results that uh, that have been uh, addressed before. Uh, in Slovakia, uh, we have uh, identified this state housing development fund, uh, which is a fund. That really uh, has uh, has been working uh, in creation of long-term loans, uh, most used for housing maintenance, which is a, a crucial issue in, in many Central and Eastern European countries uh, uh, regarding their housing stock. Uh, in Austria, we have this uh, this uh, tool of the smart flats in, in, in Vienna, uh, which have combined. A, a, a higher share of public subsidies per square meter in exchange of uh, of the of the creation or, or the building of a, a smaller dwellings around 65 square meters as an average. And finally, in Latvia, we have identified this uh, housing warranty program for families to become home homeowners. Um, is, is a kind of state aid. Uh, that is helping to pay um, less affluent people up to 30% uh, of, of their mortgages. Territorial cohesion and planning is another uh, important issue that has been addressed in the, in the, in the report. And uh, we have identified uh, uh, two, two um, aspects uh, that were also mentioned in the, the presentation of before this uh, section 106 uh, of the English Town and Country Planning Act of 1990 and also this uh, category of subsidized housing in Vienna. Uh, both of them address this idea of reserving uh, a part, uh, a, 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 an important part in Vienna. In fact, it's two thirds, as was mentioned before as well, uh, of, um, of, uh, of all developments in the, in a, in a city for uh, affordable housing, uh, public housing in different kinds. So this is a good way to approach to increase this stock of available uh, social housing. And in the Netherlands, uh, we have identified this net project which is a web portal that allows tenants to access 
uh, uh, that allow tenants to, to access uh, to offers of social housing at supranational level, which is not always the case in many countries. As, us as usually, this this, pos this this possible benefit is only locally based; it's only for the locals. So they have identified they are using this tool to allow the the uh, the, pro the provision of social housing to people of different municipalities. Um, in this slide, uh, we have uh, co condensed uh, the uh, the idea or the, the, the two other major issues issues identified in uh, in in several countries: social rental housing and housing deprivation. In relation to social rental housing, uh, there are two different approaches. First, uh, addressed in the report, I mean. First is the size uh, of its share. So the idea of uh, how to, uh, which are the tools used to increase its share. And second is uh, its mis mismanagement, mis mismanagement issues or misuses. Um, in relation to this share, um, again, the, these housing associations like organizations are a crucial tool both uh, uh, have been identified both in Austria, also in the Netherlands and in Spain, um, and in the United Kingdom. And uh, in uh, Slovakia, this has been done, done directly uh, with uh, municipal resources, uh, with the provision of a, a quite, quite, quite relevant uh, number of uh, public uh, housing by um, the municipality of Nove Mesto, not the home. Uh, and once again, uh, one of the key issues here, as was identified by, by Milan, our reporter from S uh, Slovakia, is basically that uh, it has been a, a consistent, uh, a, so a, a consistent policy uh, through years, throughout the years, to provide a, 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 a sufficient or, or, a, or at least a, a relevant a, a amount of uh, social housing. There is, there is never sufficient, but at least there is relevant, yes, uh, amount of, of social housing. And in relation to housing deprivation, uh, I, sorry, and in relation to mismanagement or misuse, several bad practices and problems have been uh, uh, identified in the United Kingdom and in the Netherlands, especially as a consequence of the 2007 global, uh, global financial crisis in relation to transparency, to transparency, how to coordinate public goals and public policies uh, towards housing with uh, private interests uh, of this uh, of these uh, housing associations, uh, problems of their funding, problem of managing uh, tenants there, the skewness phenomenon, which is a creation of a permanent dependency of certain households uh, to these subsidies and this provision of social housing and uh, without any kind of rotation, uh, which created uh, which creates uh, long waiting lists. Uh, and and uh, so these kind of issues are also uh, have been also identified in the report and I are addressed uh, somehow. And in relation to housing deprivation, uh, here as, uh, uh, we, we have been concerned of universal accessibility to housing of the uh, in an aging socia uh, society and for disabled people, uh, renovation of certain housing stock and improvement of uh, energy efficiency. Here uh, we mentioned some of the of the findings. Uh, we have uh, found this uh, energy sprung project. Uh, which combines energy and renovation works uh, in buildings uh, paid by future energy energy cost savings uh, quite su successful in the Netherlands. Then we have this in, S in Slovakia, as mentioned, this uh, in huge investment in uh, renovation of housing, of all housing stock. 65% uh, uh, of multifamily res residential buildings have been refurbished. This is a great success from our perspective. In Austria, uh, energy standards in new construction and refurbishment of uh, social housing have been increased. This is uh, good news as well. It's a big effort uh, towards this green deal in Europe. And in Lat Latvia, uh, there, is, there are special schemes for renovation of large housing uh, estates for the disabled people and for people and the most dis disadvantaged people. And basically, um, these are uh, these common challenges and practices. Uh, uh, identified at national level to prevent, to tackle, to react that can inspire policies uh, in other countries, in other regions, in other cities, and also at the, at the European level. And finally, what we wanted to show you are the lessons learned. Uh, they are summarized in this uh, sort of octopus here. Uh, I think it's rather small. I, I am not sure whether you can read it properly or not. But basically, um, this is a kind of summary saying, okay, what we have, what have we learned of this out of more or less 60 or 70 pages long uh, report and study? Basically, is 
Uh, first, first lesson is we need to achieve a functional mix of housing tenures, um, which can be achieved through an informal harmonization with, uh, within the EU to achieve uh, true alternative housing tenures to home ownership. Um, for example, functional tenancies. Tenancies uh, should be approached following the, uh, a, a combination and equilibrium of interest of tenants, affordability, stability, flexibility, and also of landlords, profitability, safety. Um, uh, finding new types of intermediate tenures. In Catalonia, for example, in 2015, were introduced this shared ownership and temporal ownership uh, under the auspices and the inspiration of the United Kingdom, su a successful introduction of these tenures in the United Kingdom and in the Netherlands. The community land trust, they have also been mentioned in the, in the previous uh, presentation, and also functional housing in cooperative systems with a proper fr framework to allow people to um, to uh, create this kind of collaborative, uh, collaborative uh, property. Second lesson learned is the widespread of housing associations like institutions to boost collaboration between public and private initiative, already mentioned as well, to avoid conflict of interest uh, due to their high in nature and also avoid mismanaging. So there are two uh, things that should, should be bear in mind. Be careful, in, so they are very interesting institutions, but be careful but, uh, to uh, avoid this, uh, these problems of their managing and, and this um, conflict of interest that might, may arise between um, the private side of institutions and, the, and their public goals and the public desired policies. Se third uh, lesson learned uh, is that urbanization has led to population concentration, uh, scarcity of suitable land, housing and affordability, housing de deterioration and displacement of the less affluent. Um, some examples uh, provided here, like big interventions of public pact funds, like in Vienna or in Slovakia, and a proper policy of territorial cohesion are advised. Um, never forget uh, targeted policies for the homeless and also for, for those housing excluded. Sometimes, as has been uh, addressed also in some of the questions of, of, of the previous presentation, uh, um, um, a, a big amount of, of social uh, housing doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the problems of, of, of homeless people are, re are really addressed. Fourth thing is the warranty of universal accessibility to housing for the elderly and the disabled. Um, housing instead of repair and energy efficiency are also essential. Fifth lesson is patching the laws or creating in, in, incoherent or uh, contradictory multi-level housing legislation does not work. Sixth, sixth lesson is, trustworthy, is, is to create a trustworthy and independent housing research that can help to properly orientate housing policies. Observatories or housing institutes are very interesting partners to municipalities, to policymakers, to create proper legislation to create proper policies. And finally, and this is the seventh one, and the end of my presentation, is the, uh, that the need, uh, there is a huge need of increasing the literacy in the field of housing among citizens. Many opportunities are lost because, because people don't know their, their rights, they don't know what, what, what to do. Uh, social movements are doing a great work there, and I think uh, we should uh, go on transferring um, and com communicating uh, trustworthy housing research and housing information to citizens. Anyway, thank you very much uh, for your uh, for your uh, attention. And if there are any questions, we are here to help. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Nuria. Thanks a lot, Sergio. Uh, I know that was uh, kind of difficult to condense in twenty minutes your uh, several months of work, a lot of a lot of case studies and 146 pages of, of, of study. So uh, all those that we have several experts here that I'm quite sure will follow up uh, uh, on, the, on the study, on the, on the things that you have just mentioned and uh, both on the lesson learned and on the specificities of, of specific uh, uh, interventions uh, at, at local level that you have surveyed. Um, um, I would like to invite the two of you to remain with us, uh, if you can. This, this for this uh, more or less one hour discussion that we have with uh, with other experts that is uh, mostly focused on the way forward. So we would like to see, okay, given that this is the state uh, of play of problems and concrete actions that we have uh, on the ground, what are the strategies and what are the actions that we can plan uh, in 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 the near future? So perhaps we can inter interact with uh, with uh, the experts that would now take the floor, or even respond. Uh, we have a joint uh, um, 
Q and A session if uh, participants want to ask you questions. So I would like to invite uh, the other author of 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 this study, uh, Milan Fataknik, to turn on uh, his webcam. He's uh, chair of the Smart Solution and Innovation Council on top of being a uh, former mayor of Bratislava. So he has a, a clear uh, a view on how tough it is to manage these uh, problems uh, at, the, at the local level. And he's also a professor at Comenius University of Bratislava. Uh, Milan, when you can, please turn turn on your webcam. Uh, and we are also happy to have with us uh, Laura Collini, that is senior policy expert uh, at the EU Urban Inno Innovative Action and Urbact as well, among other uh, titles and positions that, uh, that she's holding. Uh, we have Sonia Alves, that is research fellow at the Institute of Social Sciences of the University of uh, Lisbon. And uh, Balint Ms. Metix, senior policy advisor at the municipality of Budapest, instead. Uh, please come to the stage, if I can use this uh, formulation. Uh, don't be shy. This is not the moment of, uh, uh, of, of, of uh, shy away. I see Sonia is now with us. I would like actually first to connect. Uh, between the presentation of the study and this discussion on the way forward to give the floor first to Milan Fataknik um, uh, that uh, also contributed to the study and uh, is uh, perhaps uh, uh, the best person to introduce to the policy recommendation and suggestions that the, that the study brings in um, so that uh, we can build on that and perhaps uh, have a feedback from the other participants as well. Milan, are you are you with us? You have to turn on on the left hand side of uh, the platform. There's an icon with the mic and the camera. You should you should turn them both on. Uh, same for Laura that I don't see yet. They are both connected though. Here you are, Laura. We are missing Milan. The other, the other um, information that I would like to, to give, Laura and Balint have uh, uh, very short presentations uh, that I don't know whether you can or uh, that we can upload uh, also for the participants. The participants to, uh, you know, we have many experts uh, among the audience. So I am quite sure that they would benefit from uh, from the expertise that you have condensed uh, in the in the in the slides. Uh, I also have to express not only a very big thank you to all the participants of the and organizers of the Housing Week, uh, the the Party of European Socialists at the European Committee of the Regions, the S and D Group, the City of Vienna. Uh, and the Party of European Socialists, but also to the uh, partners that uh, with FEPS have led this uh, study, particularly the uh, Foundation for Solidarity and Freedom in Latvia, the Friedrich Erbe Stiftung, the Spanish-based uh, Pablo Iglesias Foundation, and Masarykova Academia, uh, Democratic Academia, uh, that is based in Prague. That was uh, an attempt to to link together different foundations in different member states, uh, because on this on this topic it is really necessary to gather bottom up, as has been said, uh, the the knowledge on the concrete uh, uh, housing policies. Milan, I see you online. Can you try to uh, you know give us give us a hint of uh, after this study on what are we recommending what we would like what we would like to see happening in the near future uh, hello everybody my role is even harder than mr professor because i have only five minutes to to present something like 30 recommendations that we collected yeah. in the study and i will start with the with the with the sentence that housing situation in european countries regions and cities is very different due to their long-term approach to to housing based on mix of market approach and and uh, state intervention in some countries they pre 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 some preferred the the universal approach to housing 
which, which is covering the low and middle income families with the co concept of social and affordable housing. And of course, aiming at social mix. But in other countries, they were only uh, have a targeted policy, mainly focusing on low income families and vulnerable groups and leaving all the others to the, to the market solutions. This is the situation which we can face in all Europe. How to come out of that? I think the progressive solution is to say we need the housing for all. And housing for all means that we should translate this to concrete actions in social and affordable housing. If the social should cover mainly the low income and vulnerable groups, the affordable means that we should not leave behind the middle income groups. And the, the problem is that this is also the, the multi-level issue. We cannot solve the problem only on the level of the city. So recommendations, our recommendations are divided into the recommendations for the local and municipality level, the national and regional level, and the European level. All of them are important in solving the issue, mainly the local and the national, because without the national support, you are not able to solve the things on the, on the local level. So if the city decides to make a policy housing for all, including social and affordable housing, we recommend to make a housing policy on the level of the city and to try to find partners for that. Even in Vienna, which is a good example of the city solving the problems on a local level, the city itself is not building the majority of the new construction in the city. So they also fight partners. Uh, Professor Nazar already mentioned the housing associations, which we strongly recommend as one of the possibility solutions to combine the efforts of the city with the possibilities of the special institutions devoted to the new construction. So this is something that, that is possible on, on the level of the city, where we think that also the issue of renovation is very, very important. And there will be European funds which will, which will help in that, because this is one of the lines of the green transformation that we are facing. Of course, we, we need to keep in mind the inclusiveness of housing, not to leave behind the vulnerable groups, elderly already mentioned. So these people should be somehow included, provided by the city with the special services, social services, combined with the housing. Housing is the prerequisite for solving the, the homelessness, for having people with us, but we need to provide for some of them the special so social services. So this is the level of the city. On the level of the, of the national and, and regional level, we recommend to evaluate and, just, and adjust the national and regional housing policy and to prefer the universal approach, not that targeted approach looking only on the low income and vulnerable groups, but the universal approach covering also the middle income fa families and adopting a legislation which will cover also this. This will help the cities and the regions to, to build their, their own housing stock with the help of the national legislation and national funds. Very strong recommendation is to acknowledge the right to housing as a subjective right, which is very, very strong one. And it's not uh, solved in many countries of Europe, but this will help to people to have a right for housing which is not the case now in the constitutions and legislation uh, of, the, of the particular European countries. Of course, the urban planning uh, should be one of, the, one of the solutions for the land scarcity. This is also the level of the city to solve where we will build the new construction, providing the social and affordable housing for all. The problems of urban planning and social cohesion already mentioned by, by my predecessors are also in our recommendations as very, very important. Of course, this is support for the rehabilitation, refurbishment of the, of the existing housing stock. And the European level, we see as very important to present the issue also on this level and say housing is also the issue of Europe. 
despite of the fact that the real instruments are on the level of local and national, Europe should, should uh, make concrete support for this, making data, making uh, analysis, research, and somehow enabling or, or, or opening the space for the affordable housing, because the state aid uh, legislation that was adopted on the level of European Union in 2012 is restricting the, the possibility of the national legisl legislation of supporting also the affordable housing. But we still insist on social and affordable, so we should somehow uh, knock on the door of European Commission and ask for changing this with the connection to European pillar of social rights, not only looking on affordable housing for vulnerable groups, but also for middle income families. There are a lot of recommendations which I did not mention, but we need clear policy, partners, legislation, finances, and support from all the three levels to solve the problem. So this is my this is my short summary of the recommendations. You can find them in detail in our study. Thank, thanks, Milan. I, it, it was it was really tough, and we appreciate. Uh, I know that Laura has prepared also um, a, a set uh, a set of slides. I might try myself to to, to screen them. I no, no, no. I have it. You have it. I, I do it. Uh, that actually build uh, on. Uh, on our study um, and, and on her and on her work as well with the uh, okay. with the EU Urban uh, Innovative Action and uh, One Pact. Uh, Laura, you have uh, the floor. I don't know what we we see something strange actually at the moment. A rather futuristic uh, uh, image. Let me try. Do you hear me? We we can hear you, and I think Hi. now now it is should be possible to see the presentation. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. I have, yeah. Thank you very much. The participants of, should be able to uh, select from the. Uh, there's an icon in the bottom right part. They can select yeah. the way in which they choose to see uh, our conversation and the slides. Okay, so. First of all, thank you very much and good evening, everyone. Thank you for the organizers and thank you also to Michaela Coward for inviting me. So I've been asked to, um, to contribute to this section, delivering on affordability and also looking, I've been said not to refer to the COVID because there's a special session. And also to say what is behind the bold statements about the right to housing, what are cities doing? So I really put together, if I can go to the next slides, please, some of the reflections that we have been uh, listening uh, these days, yesterday and today, and to have them written down in a way that uh, we really to understand what are the strategies for not delivering um, uh, affordable housing. So we really had uh, uh, many different tools and measures in action for many, many years. Um, to make housing not affordable, really overlooking social housing, protected rents in favor of home, home ownership. And this has influenced everyone, every individual on personal level, on mindset creation through media. So saying that, you know, um, home ownership, including myself, is something that secures the, um, the precarity of your working life for the future. And so then we have a set of reforms that change land and planning, limiting ownerships and, and public ownership and control, deregulation of property market, uh, laws allowing private large investors to enter property markets um, all over Europe, also massive privatization, lack of measures in relation to homelessness and so on. Many of these measures have to do with uh, decision taken at the central level. So where uh, state governments are accountable for this. And very often I think that um, although we repeat these points many, many times, we have too little uh, time for exchange with people that are working at state level. So we tend somehow to have uh, as well the, the European level and the city level, and then we miss somehow the middle. 
uh, in our conversation. At uh, the European level, when uh, Franz Timmerman yesterday was saying what Europe can do to certain levels, say, well, what the principles that we have, they will be translated at a national level. But cities also have limited power on this. We need the central, uh, the middle part, with the, the state level. And the state level, it's somehow missing why some of these things are not functioning. So the demands are many and they're coming from different voices here. I don't mention them. And there are bold demands and we have repeating those demands. I mean, social movements are repeating those demands. The PA in Spain has been uh, making a flags of all this, many of these demands and, and so on. Move to the next one. Um, what we've done, I'm an urbanist, I'm uh, just a, a researcher, a policy oriented research. So we launched an initiative that put together two European programs, um, mostly working with cities and say, okay, let's uh, discuss or share what cities are actually doing um, to implement the right to housing, exchanging practices, ideas that are working or maybe not working completely, but they have at least the tendency of the political will to deliver uh, the right to housing. And so we invited in this case, with in our little initiative is not changing the world, but we invited as much as possible the EU institutions, for instance, the MEP, um, Kim Fox Parentac, which has been proposing the report on affordable housing, which has been adopted recently. Uh, we had international organizations as Fianza, Housing Europe, some of the people that you know that are also participating here, but also we involved um, as much as possible uh, representative of um, um, cooperatives, um, um, social movements, activists, and myself part of a neural network, international um, network of urban research and action. So we somehow tried to build this dialogue and what I'm presenting a very few snapshots of uh, examples that I um, put here. So if you go to the next slide, please. Um, so we have been discussing in this initiative uh, different forms of non-market oriented collaborative housing. Um, one of the main references uh, of the examples, Joaquin is part of the of this group of, uh, of participants today, um, knows very well is the Community Land Trust Brussels, who is one of the actors promoting Calico, is a social mix. Sorry, um, yeah, um, sorry, yeah, the, the previous page, uh, the one on uh, on the examples. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, um, but we also talked about co-housing in Berlin, different kinds of uh, social makes and affordable rents. One of the examples of uh, Calico is also trying to uh, um, um, uh, have a model of a community land trust uh, in collaboration with uh, um, local NGOs, feminist association, association uh, um, focusing on care, but also including housing first in the same, um, in the same building. Next slide, please. We looked at examples of um, um, in which, for instance, subsidies uh, provided by the cities of Ghent for renovation, they uh, have been uh, created in the forms of, uh, of subsidy ret retention for revolving funds. So funding are given to um, uh, owners to as a contribution to um, to for essential renovation works if the housing is the unit and once a refurbished is going to be sold the the contribution has to be put back into common pool these are experiments that are now being developed and they are developed within the uia uh, program it's a european money funding both the calico project as well as the other one that i mentioned here it's called the yes we rent is a the creation of uh, um, citywide cooperatives in of tenants in Mataró, which is incentivize homeowner to rent um, vacant buildings. Next slide, please. I have only five minutes to go through all of them, but these materials will be available on the platform that we are creating with the two programs. So in terms of measures also in the definancialization of, um, of uh, housing, we I mentioned few points like public acquisition of vacant distress assets, uh, something that a policy that has been followed by the city of Barcelona in the frame of the right to housing plan. Um, then um, I'm looking at uh, example, we've been looking at examples of uh, limit purchase of large, large investors, obviously the campaign in Berlin of Deutsche Wohnen and Teigen 
Um, another one, the municipal uh, preemption rights is a right of first refusal, which is um, um, part of um, our planning code, town planning code in French, um, in, in France and in Germany. But in Germany has been used in uh, in Berlin, especially in the Friedrichshain and Kreuzberg, and has been used also to for now for foot, for repurchasing 42 uh, buildings for an investment about 28 millions of euros. Um, um, we have been looking also, I mentioned this one here because I thought it's interesting, it's not part of the initiative, but there, there is a, a proposal at the um, Dan, uh, uh, New York University of a white paper that talk about social housing development authority, um, a new body which is able to purchase distressed real estate and, and making a disposal basically to finance financing transfer to social housing sector. So last uh, point is uh, my reflection. So the ca causes and effects of what we are discussing today are very much known, but I think they need to be further exposed to understand exactly what are the mechanisms and how the unaffordability of housing really rolls out um, in many different ways in the forms of uh, extractive capitalism the way we know it. Um, so I think we have to, uh, push politically more in making actors that are accountable for the, the strategies of um, strategies of um, uh, of making housing unaffordable and to make to push politically to have more transparency of data and observatories of um, retracing investments uh, transactions and things that have been said before one point which is at least of my for me, particularly important is that very often when we talk about solutions, um, we don't verify as much as, um, as it should be whether these solutions really are functioning, active and really changing the situation on the ground. Um, for instance, yesterday we were hearing the mayor of Lisbon was talking about the safe rent idea, which uh, was talking about the Airbnb um, for sort of a former Airbnb apartment, which have been somehow um, not subsidized, but um, uh, has been created an agreement with uh, people that were renting their properties uh, in Airbnb and um, creating an agreement for uh, renting for five years in a certain way, securing uh, um, the accessibility of unhoused people to access uh, those uh, those apartments. In a certain way, there are there are local movement, social movements in the area, we say, well, this is not working very well. People are not functioning, the, the measure is not functioning exactly as it should be or is expected to be. So I think that uh, the knowledge and the way, and I'm finishing here, the knowledge that we share and the discussions that we have on measures, on solutions that need to be further um, verified and uh, with um, uh, social group, social movements, um, unions um, of tenants, as well as involving, for instance, other voices like European housing coalitions that, um, that are, have a really um, activist and militant perspectives that are actually um, uh, questions uh, what is really happening in reality. And I stop here. Laura, thanks a lot for this uh, uh, very interesting peels of knowledge. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I'd like to pass the floor to Sonia. I know, Sonia, that uh, from the University of Lisbon you have a, a great track record of works on planning in particular, and we mentioned the need of planning uh, several times in the, in, in, the, in the publication. So perhaps you can help us understanding what it means planning in practice or how, how we can improve on that. You have the floor. Uh, you are you are muted. Perhaps you can. Uh, you have. Sorry. Perfect. Um, thank you for inviting me to discuss strategies and actions for social and affordable housing. As a social geographer, I would like to emphasize, in fact, the importance of land policy and land use planning for promoting social and affordable housing, as well as inclusive developments. My argument here is that besides more public investment in housing for the supply of new social and affordable housing, as well as the renovation of existing stock while avoiding evictions, we need to adopt a more progressive and inclusive 
land use planning agenda. And some cities are actually already doing this. As cities such as Vienna, Copenhagen, London, they have drafted long-term strategies to foster the provision of more affordable and decent housing via land use planning and not for profit and cost-based models of provision. These cities seem committed to delivering better outcomes, not only in terms of volume of new housing, but also in terms of location, size, rent prices and quality. The strategies aim to provide inclusive environments in which housing tenors, rents and size of dwellings are mixed so that families of all kinds in terms of incomes, composition, etc. can find a decent place to live there. And why are these land policy and land use planning tools so crucial? Because one of the main barriers for affordable housing is the high cost of land and limited access to land by affordable housing developers. And also because land values are a function of many attributes related to discretionary planning decisions and investments. For example, the value of land in a certain area is a function of its proximity to infrastructure, transport, education, etc., of its permitted uses and of its allowed density. This explains why in liberal countries, such as England, planning authorities have used planning obligations to recapture part of the value created by planning decisions that generate the so-called windfall or bonanza gains. They use these obligations to force developers to bear the cost of mitigating developers' negative impacts and to address affordability gaps that otherwise would need to be funded through the public purse. And what are the planning tools that can contribute to this more progressive planning agenda? They have been labeled inclusionary housing tools or planning obligations for affordable housing. They typically require developers to build affordable housing towards a certain percentage of social and affordable housing. Usually they are prescribed both in national, regional, and as well as local legislation. At the local level, they can be prescribed in legally binding plans, both for the entire municipality and for specific areas within it. For example, following the rezoning of lands for particular projects or following significant infrastructure investments. Often the quantity and type of affordable housing units required by planning authorities depend on local housing needs, the characteristics of development schemes for which planning permission has been sought and the availability of housing grants. Examples, as you well know, are the Section 106 agreements in England, often referred as planning obligation, and the 25% rule applied in Denmark, namely in Copenhagen. In both cases, the obligations that form the agreement are based on site-specific negotiations but local planning authorities' policies for planning obligations are published and included in local plans. In both Denmark and England, affordable housing will be acquired and managed by housing associations. Evidence from the English case, presented by Crook and Whitehead, for example, indicates that when developers are informed at an early stage about the specific contributions that they must make for their proposal to be accepted, they can negotiate a lower price for the land and thus fees and charges are passed back to the landowner. This limits land speculation. Even though it's true that we can find concrete positive examples, it's also true that housing problems have intensified everywhere and planning authorities have lost control over the use of dwellings in cities. On this point, it's worth recalling that in historical areas of many cities, such as Lisbon, one third of the housing stock consists of short term lets, not to mention the buildings that have been transformed into hotels and similar. In that a, ver a high vacancy rate contrasts with an increase in local families struggling to find adequate housing. There is something particularly wrong where we have urban regeneration projects, and I have evaluated a few of them. 
that are publicly funded, but which have no obligations to preserve the affordable housing that already exists or protect the people who live there. If we think that housing problems were a key reason for the institutionalization and development of land use planning in the 20th century, and that the first planning legislation aimed to reform poor housing conditions, and that over the last half century, as neoliberal views have prevailed, the link between planning and housing has been weakened, then in this context of a global pandemic, it's time to rebuild this link and to provide a pragmatic but sustainable response to the housing crisis. It's time to reform policies <clears throat> and practice so that we can remake cities according to the values of social inclusion and justice, justice which allows us to create more sustainable housing markets. Thank you. And Thank for you, now. Sonia. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And, uh, I look, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I, yeah, I look now at uh, Balint, uh, and just uh, to add a little bit of pressure to your uh, intervention, you are not only you are not only a senior policy advisor at the at the municipality of Budapest, but for this year, for the year 2020, you've been nominated the European Young Leader, uh, and you have uh, a, a past as an activist and also founder of the the City is for All. So we, we, we left you also at the end because we would like some inspiration and some kick in uh, 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 you know, call for action if you, if you want. You have the floor. Okay, um, thank you very much uh, for uh, including Budapest to this discussion and also thank you for the organizers um, for keeping um, affordable housing and right to housing um, on the agenda, I would like to share my screen because I compiled um, just two brief slides um, in order to make my brief intervention more um, structured. Um, I hope you can see it. Um, so first, I would like to, um, in what is a more local perspective on the aforementioned issues, uh, than the previous interventions. I would like to um, just briefly summarize the situation here in Budapest in order to put the next part of my intervention, uh, the kind of modest uh, achievements and, and humble um, initiatives that we took uh, in the past one and a half year um, to perspective. Um, so the first challenge is obviously uh, decreasing affordability. Uh, and while that is a common challenge, of course, throughout Europe, um, it should be noted that the um, the extent of affordability problems are perhaps uh, quite um, unusual in in Budapest, and the uh, the speed of uh, the situation's deterioration is also um, somewhat extreme. Um, here you can see how the rents, the average rents in the private rental sector um, have increased. They essentially doubled uh, in a few years in Budapest. This is data for the um, average advertised rent um, for new contracts between 2011 and 2018. Um, obviously, the, um, the increase of average incomes in the city was uh, much uh, lower and and slower in the same period but it is not only about rent it is also about house prices in budapest the um the increase of house prices was actually the highest among 150 large cities in the world um, between two between 2018 and 2019 and it was the second highest um between 2019 and 2020. um the second uh, major challenge is the very limited uh, public housing uh, sector or social housing sector in Budapest as an unfortunate legacy of the uh, quite extreme privatization policies pursued since the late 80s and especially in the 90s. Um, the public housing stock only amounts to around uh, five, which also means that the municipality of Budapest itself has very limited power over uh, their regulation or uh, use. 
The third um, important challenge is that the private rental sector is not only very and increasingly expensive, it is also very informal and insecure. And while these issues um, are most, uh, most visible and most felt in uh, the larger cities and especially in Budapest, um, the municipality, municipality of Budapest has very limited uh, legal power over the regulation of uh, tenancies. Um, and th those regulations are quite dysfunctional, but also uh, they are very rarely enforced. They can be uh, hardly enforced. Um, now, the fourth challenge is the more um, narrow social aspect of housing, uh, indebtedness, uh, areas in utilities, um, evictions, and also homelessness. And, and uh, I should also mention as, as, as an overarching challenge, the lack of central government and EU funding for affordable housing development. Um, a little bit of political context, political context uh, is perhaps warranted here. Um, there is an in, a quite uh, intensive political conflict between the central government and the local authorities of uh, larger cities. Um, here in Hungary, um, the local authorities of many larger cities and most of the districts uh, of Budapest are led by um, opposition parties. And this situation has led to unprecedented cuts uh, to, uh, to the funding of, or in the funding of, um, of the already underfinanced uh, local authorities. Um, so these are the five challenges. I just thought of uh, useful to mention these in order to put the, the next part of my intervention into perspective, which is what we have been trying to do um, in the past, uh, I suppose it's, it's, it's closer to a year than one and a half a year, um, beside, of course, navigating the coronavirus uh, crisis. Um, we we have been quite active in um, providing affordable rental units to homeless people. Of course, the number of rental units that we could uh, provide um, is 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 inadequate if you compare it to the extent of the homelessness problem in Budapest. Uh, but that close to ninety public housing units that we have been able to provide so far is uh, rather significant if you compare it to the overall housing stock uh, managed by the municipality of Budapest, which is only about uh, 1,200. Um, and we thought that this is important not because, not only because of the direct benefits it provides to, to homeless people, uh, which is, of course, even more emphasized with the uh, coronavirus crisis, but also because it is, in a way, a matter of um, reframing the issue of homelessness um, and to present that the the uh, the real solution to homelessness the only real solution to homelessness is in fact providing um, housing instead of um, the provision of shelters um, in 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 terms of prevention of uh, homelessness we also changed the local regulation in order to prevent evictions and to to implement a ban on evictions to the street, that is the, the eviction of uh, former uh, tenants without the provision of a minimally adequate alternative. Uh, unfortunately, the municipality of Budapest could only do so um, within the framework of, um, of the municipality's own um, housing stock, but there are promising signs that district level local authorities uh, follow this path and, and, and increasingly um, um, adopt uh, a similar approach and revise their uh, local regulations. Um, the municipality of Budapest also reintroduced uh, a housing allowance scheme, which um, has been operating since uh, the mid nineties, but then was stopped by the previous uh, right-wing um, uh, city council. Um, this is a yet somewhat limited housing allowance scheme that provides uh, assistance to low-income families um, in order for them to be able to afford uh, publicly, municipally owned um, utilities, that is uh, water, sewage um, services, uh, garbage collection, and also um, district heating. Um, we are in the process of preparing um, 
a model uh, of social rental agency. This is actually um, this work is uh, is supported by the European Social Catalyst Fund, and we work together with uh, Hungarian NGOs and research institutes, as well as the um, with partner partner organizations from uh, Poland and uh, the Municipal Institute of Housing and Renovation of uh, Barcelona. Here, the idea is to extend the affordable rental sector by um, by including um, some of the uh, underutilized uh, units from the private rental sector. Um, we also um, proposed a rather strict restriction of uh, short-term rentals um, because it it is arguably one of the factors of the uh, of the significant increase in rents. The issue here is that this uh, le legal power uh, to restrict short-term rentals was uh, given by the government, by the parliament, not to the municipality of Budapest, but to the district level local authorities. And uh, so far, district level local authorities are uh, somewhat uh, timid in this uh, issue, which is uh, perhaps related to the fact that uh, uh, any regulation on uh, private property in housing is a very touchy uh, topic in, in, in Hungary. Uh, it is somewhat of a um, sacred um, thing that it, that that the politicians are are somewhat reluctant to address. But nonetheless, we we propose a strict regulation which would only uh, allow for the uh, use of rent of housing units for short term rentals in a shorter period of uh, the year for maybe uh, two months or or uh, three months. Um, and finally. Um, the the Brussels representation of the municipality of Budapest has been actively lobbying for direct EU funding opportunities uh, for cities. This initiative has started in collaboration with the capitals of the Visegrad countries. Uh, but my understanding is that the related position paper um, arguing for uh, enabling cities to apply directly for uh, more resources is now supported by uh, close to 40 cities uh, all around Europe um, and uh, while I, I I don't think that there has been any significant change in this respect uh, there also seems to be a growing momentum for this uh, at least as far as the um, European Parliament is uh, concerned um, yes so I would I would uh, I would perhaps conclude by um, by restating that uh, if if you if you if you are you know as as a mayor or as a city council or as a policy advisor you are trying to address um a city level uh, the city level housing crisis um in 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 a political context in which the central government uh, is not uh, does not share these uh, policy priorities then it is increasingly important uh, to look for uh, alliances um, at the European Union level, not just alliances from a political point of view, but also for uh, resources and and good practices and so on. And uh, and it is for this reason that I was also happy to uh, participate in this uh, panel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Balint. Uh, thanks a lot. <clears throat> so we are collecting uh, two questions: one from uh, from myself. And the other one from uh, Joaquin de Santos, the, from the Community Land Trust uh, Brussels, that has been mentioned uh, already a couple of a couple of times as a, as a good uh, uh, initiative. My question, perhaps uh, I look at Sergio, Sergio in particular, but maybe other authors uh, and panelists uh, as well, is to respond to what uh, Laura said of sometimes the missing link between the local and the European. Uh, so, what what can we ask uh, more to to the national level in terms of framing? Uh, because in in our studies we have we have looked at local, but uh, you know uh, linked to the national uh, to the national sometimes regional regulation. So maybe we can spend uh, a couple of minutes on on uh, how you, how you see the differences between different uh, between different countries, the approach at at national at national level. What would you what would you recommend? Uh, that would be my 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 two cents uh, for uh, for a follow up question, and I let Joaquin instead ask uh, his own his own question. 
please you can you have the floor oh yeah sorry okay yeah, <laughs> I you meant the, that, the yes, sorry. then we then yeah. so they answer yeah of course answer together yeah thanks a lot for giving me the floor so so yeah really interesting uh, debate with loads of insights uh, I, I think perhaps w one thing i wanted to ask is a little bit if uh, the panelists also had any thoughts or also uh, perhaps uh, 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 Professor Nasare also in his research had any thoughts on uh, on uh, how do we finance actually all these affordable housing projects. I mean, there's a, a number of innovative housing projects going on uh, uh, across Europe. I mean, uh, us from the community land trust movement, we we also ha have seen a lot of community land trusts sprouting in different uh, European cities. And one of the questions we ask uh, ourselves is, well, yes, we do know that there are some funding gaps in terms of uh, how to make affordable housing, especially community led ones like uh, community land trust housing projects uh, happen. And uh, we are looking into, yes, aggregating perhaps uh, our smaller projects so that we can also po possibly uh, look into uh, 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 how to access uh, low, uh, EU financing instruments such as uh, uh, European Investment Bank loans. And I was wondering if panelists uh, had any thoughts on this, if it was also something you had looked into and if you had uh, also explored this, uh, this kind of question of financing. Thank you. Oh. I will not pinpoint the the question to speakers, but I think Sergio will need to 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 jump in. But uh, all the other panelists uh, and authors, uh, uh, Milan, I see as well. So Sergio first. Aura, Sonia, Nuria, Balint, let me know. Sergio first. You are muted. Microphone. Uh, uh, microphone. Top left of of the panel. Still not. We we can't hear you. Therefore, I move first to Milan while we try to solve the to solve your uh, microphone. Uh, there's a little. There should be a little icon. Milan, you go first then. Okay, I'll try to uh, uh, answer the Joachim's question first. There are two good examples uh, coming from Austria and Slovakia where you fund not only from loans coming from the European level, but you are trying to create a system of uh, supporting the loans of the local banks, of the local banks. And the system in the uh, uh, midterm and long term is coming with revolving the, prof the profits the coming from the system, and it's gathering and, and collecting more and more money. Because if you do this years from years, in Austria, it's, it's now decreasing the public support because the revolving scheme is generating the money coming from the past and, and it may be, they may be used today. The similar situation in Slovakia where we created the fund uh, providing the, the financial support to the municipalities, now also to the public and, uh, and private institutions building the rental housing with the very small, small profit. I mean, 1% interest, 1% interest, but is 1% generates in the long term or mid term the money which the fund can use again for giving another loans. And if necessary, if the, if the price of the money is 5% in bad times, not today, th so then the governments are trying only to, to cover the gap between the 5 and 1% to make the loans in, very interesting for the for the housing associations or the municipalities to build housing. So this is a good example we studied in our study, and you can find it in in studies from Austria and Slovakia in more detail. And and second, uh, the, the, the David's question about the missing national level. I think if we only focus on local and European, we are not talking about the whole problem. The whole problem is European, national and local. If you do not have a national legislation, if you have a policy which is more right-wing, I would say, focusing more on market solutions and less state intervention, this will yield to only providing the social housing for low-income and vulnerable groups, and you are missing the opportunity to provide the affordable housing for for larger groups of middle income middle income people so the national level is very very important the state can also legislate about housing associations if they will treat this as important so so laura's uh, intervention was we cannot miss this national level 
because EU cannot legislate on this and city even cannot legislate because the legislation and funding is mainly with the state, with the national level. So we need politically to address also the national level. I think it's very important and our recommendations in the study are reflecting this. Let's try again with Sergio. Do you have uh, green lights on both camera and microphone there? Yeah, and that's uh, still, 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 still not working. And I'm much uh, from from our side. I just I just spoke with my colleague Julian. Uh, I don't know whether you want to try to go out of the room and enter and enter again. That would be the only the only uh, very simple and not particularly technical solution that come to my mind. Uh, in the meantime, I have to present to to all of you that are here the other little initiative that was launched uh, during uh, this uh, housing week because we have drafted a sort of a petition that you will find uh, that you will find on uh, change change.org there's a there's a there's a link here make the right to housing a reality for all uh, basically it is a, a sort of a request for a real uh, uh, European right for housing uh, that is uh, still missing and today during the talk has been uh, evocated uh, quite a lot at the moment given that has just been launched uh, very few signatures but we are all people involved uh, with uh, you know activism uh, housing policy uh, progressive networks so I'm quite I'm quite confident that if you take a second to have a have a look uh, maybe sign it yourself or share it uh, with your network. We will soon be um, quite a substantial number. Uh, and the idea is not only to have a, um, the petition uh, and the call active now, but it is a moment in which, as you know, the European Union will discuss uh, a, social, a new social uh, agenda uh, in the near in the next weeks, including uh, including a big summit uh, in uh, Porto. Uh, in May, uh, there will be the Congress of the European uh, of the Party of European Socialists uh, this summer. We would like to bring you know this topic strong with the backing of uh, associations, people, individuals, uh, and researchers. So uh, uh, please help us in in making this call a shared uh, and a participatory uh, call. Sergio, can you hear me now? Perfect. Yes. And oh, that, I, and that's I, and I think this comes also um, fantastic because I will basically uh, give to you the right to conclude uh, to conclude our meeting. The coordinator of our study, I think this is very this is is, is, is spot on. So okay. thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, I have just written the, uh, a quick answer here for 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 Laura. I think uh, states have a crucial role. Uh, in housing, of course, it remains their, their competence. And first thing they can do is to uh, regulate housing as a fundamental right, as a true fundamental right that can be opposed in, in the courts. So once you are uh, deprived from your home, some, somehow you, you cannot access to one or you are you are addicted or, or things like that, you can uh, ask for a home in the, in the courts. This is not a, a reality. Basically, in any uh, European country, it is a reality in France but it's uh, more or less 40 something percent of the, of the times is not fulfilled. So, um, where, uh, and also in the Basque country, um, uh, but, but uh, we, we need a short, short of uh, um, widespread of this possibility. So claiming uh, uh, housing as a, as a true fundamental right, I think this might, might be one of the crucial goals. Second thing is the coordination of multi-level um, le legislation and policies. Uh, uh, of course, this is for multi-level multi, multi -level administrative uh, states, so on regional level, local level, uh, su supra-local sometimes as well, and, and EU level. So we need sort of coordination of these policies. Third thing is to provide a, a true functional framework of a different range of of housing tenures alternatives. So uh, uh, housing tenures that really work and that are really appreciated by people and they fulfill the requirements of the United Nations of, of becoming true, how, true, true homes, true dwellings. And this is not easy, but, but this, this can be done because this some, sometimes entails changing the law of hundreds of hundreds of years. But we, we have done this in Catalonia, for example. And uh, finally, uh, the, 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 there is a huge need to get proper data, proper data at all levels 
Uh, we have uh, Sonia here, also is a specialist in uh, social geographer. He, she agrees, I see. Um, it's, it's crucial to get true data about all kinds of proper, uh, of all kinds of, of, of uh, subjects related to, to homes. Uh, um, uh, home, uh, homelessness data, infra housing, uh, empty dwellings, what, what these concepts really mean. And, and, and there is also possibility for that to harmonize these concepts, concepts, concepts at the at European le level to, to get proper data. Yes, uh, this is essential. And also uh, uh, to go to do uh, proper research and also to properly transfer research to policymakers to make proper proper uh, legislation or at least adequate legislation. And in relation to the question of, of Joaquin, I, I don't have a, a, a clue for that. Of course, you are a stakeholders. You are more more in the in the in the, the field. But 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 one recommendation recommendation, one lesson learned, uh, which is explained in our report, is that it is always good to get in good terms with uh, private stakeholders. So once you get this uh, public-private private partnerships, you, you can get um, uh, funding for, for this kind of, 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 uh, of projects and, and it, uh, it uh, gives better results to, uh, to, get, to be in good terms with them, to understand their goals and their necessities and trying to match them with uh, housing uh, policy goals. Um, and, and yes, that's it basically, David. Thanks a lot, Sergio. Thanks a lot, uh, everybody. Sonia, Nuria, Laura, Balint, uh, Milan, Joaquin, and uh, the panel that uh, took place before us. Thanks to all the participants. I mentioned the publication. I mentioned the declaration. I I've mentioned also the podcast recorded, the FEPS talk with uh, Michaela Cower. Uh, the only thing that remains to be mentioned is that uh, Housing Week continues tomorrow morning at 10.30 with uh, an event hosted by the City of Vienna on the EU Affordable Housing Initiative and how we can really bring it to the ground. So tomorrow, 10.30, for all of you, see you there. Thanks a lot and uh, stay connected and share see the you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.